So what does cause autism? The scientific community have put great effort into testing whether or not vaccines cause autism. They don't. Study after study after study has demonstrated. It isn't caused by thimerosal, and it isn't caused by measles virus. So what exactly does cause autism? The short answer is we don't know for sure. But we've gathered enough data that the probable causation is getting, if not sharper, then at least a little less fuzzy. This good news couldn't come at a better time. The reported rates are increasing. At last count, 1 in 88 children in the U.S. have been diagnosed on the autism spectrum, what I'm going to start calling ASD for short. Let's start with the known risk factors for ASD. 1. Genetics. This is the single largest risk factor. If you have a sibling with ASD, you have a 2 to 8% chance of being autistic yourself. If you have an identical twin with some form of ASD, you have a 60 to 92% chance of being autistic. While if you're non-identical twins, your chances are only slightly higher than for normal siblings. This is a heck of a data point, and we'll come back to it, but these studies have been inconsistent. 2. Sex. Being male puts you at three times higher risk of ASD than being female. But we're relatively confident that this has nothing to do with genes on the X chromosome. Something else about being male is at play. It's worth noting that hormonal profiles of boys and girls at the age of a typical ASD diagnosis are not as different as they are in puberty and adulthood. Why the disease would manifest at a pre-puberty stage is a head-scratcher for a sex-linked condition. 3. Environment any prenatal exposure to toxic or birth defect causing chemicals like cigarettes or any infection during pregnancy can increase risk. Certain pesticides and antidepressants are known to increase risk when the fetus is exposed in utero. 4. Age of mother. Women over 40 have a 50% greater risk of having a child with autism than women who are between 20 and 29 years old. These risks are magnified by lack of prenatal care, like not taking prenatal vitamins. High stress during pregnancy has also been linked to the condition. 5. Age of father. Older fathers have more autistic children on average. So do obese fathers, although the effect is less. 6. Other conditions. If the child has fragile X syndrome, or low birth weight, or infant hypoxia, that's lack of oxygen, or is born through prolonged labor, the risks go up. The presence of autoantibodies, these are antibodies that recognize our cells and proteins, also increase risk. Let's take a few hypotheses and weigh them against the known risk factors. First, the single gene hypothesis. Is there a gene for autism found in 100% of affected cases and 0% of unaffected controls? No, and realistically this hasn't been a viable model for many diseases. The evidence pointing towards a primarily genetic basis is the twin concordance. Concordance, in case you didn't know, is the agreement of disease states between identical twins. 100% concordance in identical twins but lower concordance among non-identicals almost always suggests a genetic basis for disease. That's sort of the case in autism, where identical twins are up to 92% likely to be concordant, while non-identicals are at 5-10%, to not much more than non-twin siblings. We can almost certainly rule in genetic traits as a possible cause. Other studies, though, find much lower identical twin concordance, closer to 50 or 60%, which would suggest that it's not a single gene alone. Second, the autoimmune hypothesis. Large studies have found that the mothers of autistic children are more likely to have high levels of antibodies against proteins found in the human fetal brain. This model suggests that mothers react to the developing fetus by producing antibodies which attack the fetal brain and cause inflammation during development, leading to differences in brain microstructure. Other studies found these antibodies in normal controls as well, so it may be that a high percentage of women are walking around with these antibodies long before pregnancy. Just to point out, the antibodies are against the fetal brain, but not the adult brain, so there wouldn't necessarily be any effect on the adult themselves. 
Consider how this fits the evidence. Older mothers might be expected to have more of these antibodies, and siblings would be expected to be at higher risk. But it doesn't explain the disparity between identical and non-identical twins. There's a second wing to this hypothesis, and it's autoimmune antibodies found in autistic children. Higher levels of anti-brain and anti-neuron autoantibodies are correlated with increasingly severe disabilities. This dose-response relationship almost always signals an important factor. Third, the toxicology-teratology hypothesis. As I mentioned, substances known to cause birth defects also increase autism risk. That could mean that environmental damage to the child's DNA or exposure to certain chemicals in utero could trigger physiological changes leading to autism. Birth abnormalities often indicate that a child is much higher risk for ASD. The relationships here are fairly bizarre and complex. For example, abnormalities that affect mitochondrion, the energy centers found in all cells, are often associated with ASD. It's unclear how energy metabolism could have such a specific effect in the brain. Fourth, the epigenetic hypothesis. Epigenetics includes all the aspects of DNA that determine genetic inheritance, except the actual sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's. But we generally use it as a shorthand when referring to the methylation of DNA at specific points, resulting in changes to how the DNA works, or how the DNA fits into protein scaffolds in the nucleus. Epigenetics are inherited oddly, not like the classical Mendelian Punnett square, sometimes passing more along the maternal line because the male sperm is a small cell, doesn't contribute as much besides the father's DNA. The egg provides the cellular mechanisms used by the new organism, so anything about the egg that is broken or abnormal will disproportionately affect the resulting pregnancy. The strongest evidence for a role for epigenetics comes from a psychiatric drug called valproic acid, or VPA, used as an anticonvulsant and mood stabilizer. It's also a teratogen, or birth defect causing chemical, that specifically causes epigenetic changes. Its use in women who were pregnant produced children with a set of symptoms that included autism 60% of the time. If a child was exposed to VPA, the outcome was autism in 9% of cases. We've talked about a lot of possible single hypotheses, but lastly we have the complex disease or multi-hit hypotheses. I'm only going to talk about one of these because it's the one I find most likely at present. In the single hit hypotheses we've examined so far, we're looking for a condition where stimulus A produces effect Z where A is a gene or a toxin or an antibody, and Z is an ASD diagnosis. Multi-hit hypotheses work like a cafeteria-style menu. A plus B minus Q equals Z. A genetic factor plus autoantibody in the absence of protection from epigenetic changes leads to ASD of varying types. One such theory is called the excitatory inhibitory imbalance hypothesis and I'll abbreviate it as the EI hypothesis. Your brain produces various substances that promote inhibition or excitation within certain regions. This produces moods, social behaviors, learning preferences, and personality. If it's disturbed enough or abnormal enough, the result is sometimes schizophrenia or mental retardation. A child that gets multiple copies of a gene for an inhibitory protein, for whatever reason, will have this normal balance disrupted. It could be that many paths lead to a disturbance of this delicate balance in particular brain regions. Sometimes it may be chemical, or genetic, or autoimmune, or epigenetic. This hypothesis brings together many unrelated distal causes, that is, long before ASD diagnosis, any of a long list of possible causes can produce a single proximal effect, which in the case of autism is a disturbance of normal homeostasis between these inhibitory and excitatory factors. The best evidence for the multi-hit hypotheses, and there are several of them, 
is simply that too many single hits with partial matches to the risk factors, but not comprehensive coverage, exist. Unfortunately, tracking down a multi-hit model is much harder. We'll need to puzzle out all the contributory factors, all the possible permutations, and that takes time, money, and expertise. This was a pretty fast rundown of what we know. I've skipped or underemphasized other components, not on purpose, but simply in the interest of time. What I want to emphasize is that autism is a condition that is defined by symptoms, not a root cause. It's not like measles and smallpox, single diseases with a single causative agent. It may not even make sense to put it in the same category as diseases and disorders and syndromes. It might simply be a matter of degrees on a spectrum that includes the neurotypical and those with difficulty integrating in society. As always, scientists are using a method that operates by elimination. We can never positively prove a hypothesis, only discard its alternative. We've discarded a number of possible explanations for what could lead to a diagnosis of autism, but there's still more work to be done. If you want to donate to a worthy cause to advance the frontiers of knowledge on this topic, I would recommend the Autism Science Foundation, a well-ranked charity with links to reputable researchers and public health agencies. Research in this field can make a difference in the lives of children and their parents. Thanks for watching.